all for coming today. We have over 300 people in attendance. My name is Joseph Shemtov. I am the Special Collections Outreach Librarian here at the Free Library of Philadelphia. And one of my responsibilities is to organize programs like this. Before I continue, I just wanted to have a few uh, housekeeping rules. On the bottom of your screen, uh, there is ask a question. So at any time during the presentation, please feel free to click that and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Stern is gonna answer it uh, after the presentation. Also, if you're feeling ambitious, to the top right, there's an arrow pointing down. If you click that, it will get rid of the chat screen, but it will make your screen larger. So you don't have to do that, but I wanted to mention that. We have an exciting program tonight. Before I introduce you to our distinguished guest, Dr. David Stern, who's one of the foremost authorities on Jewish medieval manuscripts, I'd like to take a moment and talk to you about my own experience with the Masoretic Bible, also known as Lewis 0140, a 500-year-old Bible kept at the Free Library of Philadelphia, which Dr. Stern will talk about in great depth during his lecture. I imagine that the person who paid to have this prayer book made in 1496 or 1497, around then, during the Inquisition, must have put themselves or their family at great risk. One question we pose to students of all cultural backgrounds when they see this Bible at the library is, is there any object you hold so dearly that you would be willing to risk your life or the lives of others for? So on a more universal level, is, is the subject relating to one's personal identity and what someone is willing to risk in order to preserve it, whether it be religious, sexual, cultural, gender-related. For the owner of this Bible, who lived more than 500 years ago, it was their Jewish identity that mattered most to them, even at the risk of jeopardizing their life or the lives of others. This Bible, which I assure you, you will soon all see, also has a personal connection to me because of its history, which mirrors my family's history. Our paths cross in many places, beginning with the expulsion of the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, then in Syria, Israel, and then ending up in Philadelphia. But the greatest significance for me regarding this Bible's rich history is that it ends up in a public library in Philadelphia, just like I did. Dr. Stern will explain to you how, but for those of you who are not familiar with how special collections in public libraries work, they are different for, from academic libraries in that they are open and accessible to everyone. You don't have to be a scholar or a university student to see it. Also, it is in a public library, for example, that you can connect with people who are different from you. A public library, because of its democratic space, helps to bridge people together from all walks of life. This is something that is so badly needed today especially in America. This unique Bible gives us, as a public library, a valuable platform to discuss important and complex issues, such as identity, religious freedom, and the need for social justice. It is this need for social justice, which is why the Special Collections Division of the Free Library stands firmly in support of Black Lives Matter. Lastly, between its handwritten pages, the Free Library's Masoretic Bible also contains an important message for us today, one of hope and resilience that we will persevere and overcome the adversity that, that, that we are living through, just like this Bible did, even in the darkest of times. It is time now for me to introduce to you Dr. David Stern. He is Harry Starr, Director of Classical and Modern Hebrew in a Jewish literature and Jewish literature in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University and Director of Comparative Literature in the Harvard's Department of Comparative uh, Literature. He is also the director of Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. Before Dr. Stern went to Harvard, he was the director of classical Hebrew literature for many years at the University of Pennsylvania. Stern is the author, editor, 
and co-editor of 14 books, including parables and midrash, narratives and exegesis in rabbinic literature, rabbinic fantasies, imaginative narratives from classical Hebrew literature, the monks Hagada, a 15th century illuminated codex from the monastery of Turgensi, and the Jewish Bible, a material history printed by the University of Washington Press, for which he received the 28th Jordan Schnitzer Award, the best book in Jews and the arts from the Association of Jewish Studies. In 2017, Stern curated and wrote the catalog for Chosen, Philadelphia's Great Tabraica, an exhibit of Jewish books from Philadelphia public collections, including the free libraries, that was held at the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Stern's most recent book is Jewish Literary Cultures II, the Medieval and Early Modern Periods, the second in a series of three volumes of Stern's selected essays. He is currently working on a book tentatively entitled An Unsystematic History of the Jewish Book. Dr. Stern is married to Catherine Hellerstein, who is the director of modern Jewish literature at the University of Pennsylvania and lives in both Cambridge and Philadelphia. Here is Dr. Stern. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much for the very warm introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here on the Free Library's website. Uh, I'm just sorry that I'm not actually in the Free Library itself. It really is one of my favorite libraries. Um, I've worked here quite a bit over the years. And, uh, and I don't want to forget to say that the book I'm going to talk about, the Bible, Lewis 040, that I'm going to talk about tonight, is only one of several very great Hebrew manuscripts that the Free Library owns. And you should come all come down here and visit the Free Library and see Joseph and look at the other Hebrew manuscripts. They really have quite an extraordinary collection, also of early printed books. Um, now, as Joseph has just told us, we're living in a time of fraught, entangled identities. And it's a pleasure to be invited here tonight to speak about the fraught, entangled identity of a very special book that today is part of the Lewis Collection of the Free Library. Now, as anyone who works with books knows, books are like people. They have lives. Those lives have stories, and those stories extend even into the afterlives of books with the histories of their owners and readers. And if books are like people, Jewish books are like Jews. They have Jewish lives, and the stories of those lives are Jewish stories, with tales of wanderings from one country to another across continents and oceans, and from owner to owner, and accounts of near destruction, and alas, more often than one would wish, of destruction too, but also of miraculous salvations, adaptations, and transformations, acts of generosity and devotion, and more than anything else, acts of perseverance and survival. In one way or another, Jewish books inevitably reenact the, in their pages the lives of the Jews and more than occasionally of the Gentiles who have played a role in the lives of these books. In this talk tonight, I want to explore with you the life of one book and show you specifically how the book's material features, the book as a physical object, as an artifact, holds a meaning that goes beyond the text that the book records. And how the life of the book helps us to understand the meaning, the deeper significance and value that the book may once have held for its owner and may also hold for us as we try to understand the place of the book in history and in the Jewish historical experience. These are the big questions I want to explore in this talk, but to do this, we're going to have to start with the details. Now the book I'll speak about tonight, as we've said, holds the free library shelf mark of Lewis 140. And it's a Bible whose life was partly recovered by myself and partly by a former Penn undergraduate, Tali Arvit, some 12 years ago, when Tali wrote a spectacular senior thesis on the Bible under my direction, Tali found even more there than I imagined. On the screen, you can see the Bible as it exists today in its beautiful and delicate tortoise shell binding. 
This binding is not original to the book. As we'll see, it was probably added in the 19th century. Now, the Bible first came to my attention in an initially unpromising and quite happenstance way. About 20 years ago, I visited, I visited the Free Library's rare book collection, actually for the first time, with a colleague from the English department at Penn to look at medieval manuscripts and first folio editions of Shakespeare. And while we were there in passing, I asked one of the librarians if the collection owned any Jewish or Hebrew books. And he emphatically answered, not that I know of. But several years later, a visiting colleague from Israel mentioned to me that the Free Library had called him up and asked him to come down to look at several Hebrew manuscripts that they had discovered, as it were, in the course of recataloging the John Frederick Lewis collection, which is one of the great collections in America of French Bibles and books of hours and Oriental, mainly classical Arabic manuscripts. I immediately asked my colleague what he had seen, and he answered, oh, just a few 16th century Italian prayer books and a Lisbon Bible. Now, by the latter, I assumed he meant one of the exceedingly valuable and elaborately decorated Bibles produced in a fabulous Jewish Christian atelier that flourished in Lisbon in the late 15th century in the decades immediately before the forced departure of the Jews from Portugal in the year 1497. This is the opening page of the Lisbon Bible, now in the British Library, which is probably the most famous Bible that was produced in this workshop. And I thought to myself, how incredible it would be if a book like this was in Philadelphia. Now, I immediately called up the Free Library, made an appointment to go down to look at the Bible. What I found, however, was not at all what I expected. And it was then that the book's life first began to unfold before me. Now, we can start with the manuscript's colophon, the natural place to untangle any manuscript's history. A colophon is a paragraph that's usually found at the conclusion of the manuscript in which the scribe names himself, names the place where he wrote it, names the patron, uh, blesses the patron, and might give other details about the writing. And here's the image of the colophon, and here it is with an accompanying translation that you can read. And as you can see, though, the colophon, this colophon, is seriously mutilated, so a number of sentences are illegible. I'll read it. Uh, dot, 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 scribe, bar, in other words, son of, dot, 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 so his name and his father's name were effaced. I wrote and dot, 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 added the Masora, books for the honor of the exalted dot, 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 the respected and honored rabbi dot, 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 may God inherit, merit him to study it, he and his sons, dot, 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 until the end of the generations, and may he fulfill with it the verse that says, let not this book of the teaching cease from your lips, but recite it day and night, so that you may observe faithfully all that is written in it. Only then will you prosper in your undertakings, and only then will you be successful. I charge you, be strong and resolute. Do not be terrified or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I completed them on Tuesday, the 10th day of the month of Tammuz, in the year 5,256 to the creation of the world which is 1496 in our counting, in the city, and there, I think, I'll talk about this, I can see the letter Lamed or L, but it's, it's otherwise effaced. And then may salvation approach, may he hasten salvation. Now, as you've heard from my reading, the names of the scribe, the patron, and the place of location are all defaced so completely that it's impossible to read them today, even under ultraviolet light. And I really have tried several times with others too, to try to read it, but you can't. We don't know who exactly was responsible for this act of violence, but I can say that it's not uncommon for a later owner of a manuscript to attempt to efface the memory of an earlier owner. Some people never wanna be reminded that someone else owned something 
before they did. You probably know such people. The one thing that is clear in the Colophon is the year of the completion, 5256 or 1496. In addition, as I noted while reading the Colophon, the name of the place of production may have begun with the letter L, that is Lamed. It's so faint that it doesn't even reproduce in the JPEG on the screen, but I think that I can see a Lamed, and so did my friend from Israel. And if this was indeed the case, then the place was probably Lisboa, that is Lisbon. And as you know, the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492, and many of the Spanish exiles fled to Portugal, and they were, were permitted to remain there until 1497, when they were given the impossible choice of either to convert or to leave, and to leave their children behind in Portugal along with their possessions. So it's entirely possible that the manuscript could have been written in Lisbon in the year 1496. And this possibility was clearly the reason why my colleague called the book a Lisbon Bible. But this Bible does not look at all like the Bibles and other books produced by the famous Lisbon workshop that I mentioned earlier. Here are the opening pages of Breshit, Genesis from the two Bibles, the London Lisbon Bible on the left and the Free Library Bible on the right. And as you can see, there's no resemblance between them. Most obviously, the Free Library's Bible lacks the elaborate Italianate floral decorations around the initial word panel, a decoration found throughout the manuscripts, um, throughout the manuscripts uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Lisbon Bible Atelier products. But what the Free Library Bible did look like, however, was a typical Spanish Hebrew Bible produced in the second half of the 15th century, specifically in Castile, by Jewish scribes for Jewish owners. But let me explain what I mean here. And to do this, let me sketch briefly for you the early history of the Hebrew Bible as a book, a book is called by scholars a codex as opposed to a scroll. Now, the first Jewish biblical codices, which are also our earliest surviving codices of Jewish texts, were written in the Near East in the late 9th, 10th, and early 11th centuries. And here on the screen, you can see a typical page from one of the most famous of these codices, the Leningrad Codex, next slide please, um, so-called because it's today owned by the State Library of Russia in St. Petersburg, formerly Leningrad. The Bible was composed in Cairo in the year one, 1008. Now, as you can see, the biblical text is laid out in three columns that essentially imitate the look of a scroll. In the upper and lower margins and in the spaces between the columns, is our notes called the Mesora. The Mesora is a vast corpus of annotations that mark and enumerate every textual phenomenon in the Hebrew Bible. Every time even the slightest unusual word or phrase occurs in the text, every noteworthy syntactical and phonetic incident, every case of a discrepancy between a written form of a word and its pronunciation, and hosts of other scribal eccentricities, large letters, small letters, dotted letters, and so on. Everything unusual about the text of the Bible is noted by the Mesorah. And it's a kind of vast corpus of these annotations. And on the page before you, the Mesorah, you can see, is inscribed in two separate modes. On the upper and lower margins, written in micrography, miniature writing, you can see the Masora Gedola or Masora Magna, as it's known among Gentile scholars, the expanded full text of the Masoretic notes, while in the intercolumnar spaces between the columns, the marks that look like chicken scratchings constitute the Masorak Tana or Masora Parva in Latin, the abbreviated form of the Masora, which is usually marked with single Hebrew letters that note the number of times a word or phrase occurs in the Bible. Now, the traditional explanation of the Masora's purpose is that it was intended to safeguard the accuracy of the transmission of the Hebrew biblical text, 
but there may have been additional functions and ends that it served. We don't have to go into all of that now. These early codices of the Bible are also the first actual documentation that we possess of the existence of the Misola, and its formation seems to have coincided with the emergence of the Codex in Jewish literary culture in the shape of these early Hebrew Bible codices. Now, the reason why I've mentioned these early Hebrew Bible codices is because the direct heir, their direct heirs, are the Sephardic Hebrew Bibles, which I'm going to talk about, which replicate many of the features of the early Near Eastern Hebrew Bible codices. The connection between the two centers, the Near East and much of Iberia, was facilitated by their common location within the Islamic sphere. And the formative period of the Sephardic Bible was doubtless the period of Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula from the 10th until roughly, and in most places, the end of the 12th century. To our great misfortune, not a single Hebrew Bible or dated or localized Hebrew Bible survives from that period. The world's earliest surviving text of a dated Hebrew Bible from Spain is a Pentateuch in the University of Toronto's Fisher Library, which, is, which was written in Girona in Catalonia in 1148, but Girona was already Christianized by that point. Now, the most famous of all these early Sephardic codices was a Bible known as the Hilleli Codex, which was completed in Toledo in 1241. The Hilleli Codex itself disappeared in the 14th century, but an early copy of the, of the original is today owned by the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. And as you can see from this image, both the Fisher Library 1148 Codex and the Hilleli Codex have a page layout that closely replicates the page format of the early Masoretic Codices we looked at, like the Leningrad Codex, with the text laid out in columns and with the Mesora on the top of the page and between the columns in micrography. These, uh, these co later codices have two columns. The earlier ones sometimes have three. But in both, the Mesora is written in the same way. And all you basically have on the page are the text of the Bible and the columns and the Mesora. Now, the most revealing feature, though, of the early Near Eastern Bible Codex and the most examples of the Sephardi Bible throughout its later history is their common mode of decoration. That decoration directly reflects the contemporary Islamic book and particularly Qurans. The most obvious sign of this influence is the an iconicism that informs all these books. That is the absence of figurative representation of either humans or animals and the use of geometric architectural and floral patterns but it's displayed most vividly in its painted decorations. This feature is attested already in the early Near Eastern codices, most dramatically in the decoration of the painted pages at the beginning and the end of the book. These pages are often called carpet pages because the elaborate decorations copy those found on oriental carpets, as well as on the outer leather bindings of many of these books. These carpet pages directly reflect the designs found in contemporary Islamic Quran manuscripts. Here you can see a very similar carpet page from a contemporary Quran written in Iraq around the year 1000. And here you can directly compare, next slide please, the two, the impression, you can, you can directly see the, the two images next to each other and the impression that the host culture that is to say, the majority culture, the Islamic image, has left on the Jewish books decoration. They both have these overlapping squares in the center, surrounded by a circle inside a larger square. Now, this influence, of course, does not explain everything about the Hebrew Bible page. First, as you can see, the Masoretic page has a six-pointed star in the middle of the page within the overlapping squares, while the Islamic, the Quran page, has this kind of floret in the middle, this round sort of seal-like image. Now, the six-pointed star we're familiar with as the design of the Magain David, 
the Star of David. But you should know that in the early Near Eastern world, this design was not known as the Shield of David, the Magain David, but as the Seal of Solomon. And it was a ubiquitous magical image found in numerous Islamic sources, as well as in Jewish ones. And it had no special Jewish significance at all. And it was probably here more for its magical significance than for any sort of other reason. So its presence here may in fact also have something to do with Islamic influence. But the next detail definitely does not. The Masoretic carpet page exhibits a feature found in no other book, namely the use of micrography. We said before that the Masora is written on the text pages in this kind of miniature writing. Here you see this miniature writing again, but now it's the very basis for the geometric designs on these pages. The designs themselves are made out of the miniature writing and guess what the miniature writing consists of? The Masora, these Masoretic annotations about the text of the Bible. Such mi micrography is said to be a uniquely Jewish art form, perhaps the only truly native and original Jewish art form. And its invention also appears to have accompanied the adaptation of the Codex in Jewish culture at this time. Now, the use of carpet pages like this one persists in the Sephardi Bible throughout its history in the Iberian Peninsula. Here is one such page from a famous Bible, the, the Damascus Keter, written and painted in Toledo in 1260. Again, you can see the same types of design along with the micrography. And here are two similar carpet pages from the Free Library Bible, Lewis 140, which has several carpet pages. Now, in these Spanish Bibles, micrographic design is not limited to the, to the carpet pages. It also extends to some of the text pages of the Bible. This opening of two pages comes from the Bible written, from a Bible written in Toledo in 1230 that I mentioned earlier. The pages on the screen contain the text of the Song at the Sea, Exodus 15, which is laid out in the special stichography, the line laid out, which is dictated by halakha, rabbinic law, that's called ariach al gabe lebena, a half brick over a full brick. But here you can see the detail of it, of the, of the, uh, the uh, border around the page. There you can see that the lace is again entirely created out of micrography, and the micrography again consists of, mac of Masoretic annotations. Again, however, the, the designs here mirror traditional and more contemporaneous Islamic designs. Now, my point in discussing these various features of the Sephardi Bible is to show you how profoundly and continuously these Islamic, or better yet, Islamicizing, features characterize the Jewish Bibles produced in Spain, even though, even through, I'm sorry, even through the period of the Christian kingdoms, as I say, after Christians had conquered the Islamic kingdoms of Spain. What is noteworthy about this last observation, that the Islamic influence persists even after Spain becomes Christian, is that it violates one of the rules most commonly true of all Jewish books throughout the history of the Jewish book, which is that wherever these books were or are composed, the material features of the Jewish book almost invariably reflect the corresponding features of the, of the majority culture books, the Gentile books produced within the larger majority cultures in which the Jews producing their books at the time lived which is to say what you see here. The Jewish books produced in Germany in the 13th century will look like Gothic Latin books of the same period. Or Jewish books produced in Renaissance Italy will closely resemble Italian books of the same place and time. Yet these Jewish Bibles from Christian Spain look nothing like Christian Bibles produced in contemporary Spain. This is a Bible, a Catalan Bible, 
that's produced in 1465, the same time as the Free Library Bible. And the Free Library Bible doesn't bear any resemblance to that to the Catalan Bible, which is in the Escorial Library in Spain. They look nothing alike. The Jewish Bible's decoration is geometric and floral, like the design in an Islamic book. There are no humans on the page. Now, scholars of Jewish book art have sought to understand the meaning of this unusual phenomenon. Why these Spanish Hebrew Bibles violate this basic rule of Jewish book culture, and why the Jewish Bibles insist on looking like Islamic books, even though the majority culture was Christian. Some scholars have suggested that this was a reflex of the cultural conservatism of Sephardic Jewry, or that it represented a nostalgia that Jews and Christian Spain felt towards the so-called golden age of Spanish Jewish history, centered in Al-Andalus in the mid 10th to mid 12th centuries, when Sephardic Hebrew culture reached its apogee of its, uh, the apogee of its achievements. Indeed, Jews and Christian Spain carried on other features of Arab Islamic society as late as the time of the expulsion, like writing poetry in Arabic quantitative meters. So continuing to imitate Islamic books into Christian Spain was not entirely unique. But these explanations may all be true, but there may have been an additional layer of sig significance to the choice of decoration. Islamicizing tendencies in the decoration, in book decoration and in architecture, if you've seen any of the synagogues, like those in Toledo, um, perhaps even in writing poetry in Arabic meter, which I just mentioned, they may have served as well a more contemporary politicized purpose. They may have served as a path of resistance for Iberian Jews to resist the dominant Christian culture. That is a way for Jews to identify not only their books, but themselves, one minority culture, albeit an active one, with the other contemporary minority culture in the Hispanic Christian kingdoms. That is the minority culture of the Mudajars, which is the term that was used to describe Muslims living in Christian Spain. Like the Jews, these Spanish Muslims rejected models which they also perceived as Christian. And to the Jews, their Mudajar neighbors posed no threat. By materially identifying their books and synagogue buildings with Islamic and Mudajar style and tradition, Spanish Jews living under Christian rule may have been able to resist Christian domination and to define themselves as a minority culture. We know from other cases that the material shape of a canonical text like the Bible can shape and mirror religious identity. Here, the material form of the Hebrew Bible served as a medium of cultural self-definition. Now, there are notable exceptions to this Islamicizing tendency. The Kennecott Bible, which some of you may have seen if you've ever been to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, um, is one very notable exception. But it's true, what I've said is true of most Sephardi Bibles, and it's most dramatically evident in Bibles that were produced in Southern Castile in the final 30 years of Jewish culture in Christian Spain. That is roughly from the year 1460 until the Jews' expulsion in 1492. These Bibles produced in Toledo, Seville, and Cordova essentially reinvigorated, one might say resurrected with a vengeance, the 13th century Castilian tradition with its Islamicizing feature that I just spoke about. All, this, all of this happened just as Spanish Jews were experiencing their worst travails under their Christian rulers. It's as if their Jewish owners wanted to prove how distant, how unlike their Bibles were from Christian Bibles and how much closer, more similar they were to Islamic books. And as with the earlier Near Eastern Bibles, 
decoration here is thoroughly and iconic and is largely limited to micrographic masora and carpet pages and its designs are almost all inspired by islamic and mudajar sources indeed the 15th century bibles are even more exquisitely decorated than the earlier Castilian models. Look again at this opening with the Song at the Sea from the Toledo 1232 Bible. And now look at the same page as it appears in our Free Library Bible, which is typical of the elaborate and deluxe Bibles produced during this late period in the 15th century. And now look at these two pages side by side. In both, the biblical text is laid out and with the same distinctive line layout we've already seen. And again, the text is framed on top and bottom with the Masora inscribed in the elaborate braided micrographic designs. But in the Free Library Bible, the text is also, also surrounded by a decorated wall of interlocking rectangular panels trimmed in gold leaf. It's over the top in its ornateness. By juxtaposing the two Bibles separated from each other by roughly 250 years, you can see both the striking similarities in design and the degree to which the later Bible, composed either shortly before or after the Spanish expulsion, sought literally to exceed the splendor of its model, not only to recapture the glory of the past, but to outglorify it, to exaggerate and intensify its memory. In their colophons, those last paragraphs where the scribe names himself and talks about the book, some 14th and 15th century Spanish Hebrew Bibles call themselves by the title Mikdash Yah, the Sanctuary of the Lord, evoking the splendor of the destroyed Second Temple. The 14th century Spanish Hebrew grammarian, polemicist, and biblicist Isaac ben Moses Halevi, better known as Prophet Duran, in the introduction to his book, Masena Ephod, expanded upon the analogy between the sanctuary and the Bible by writing that God had specifically prepared the Torah to serve Israel in the time of its exile as a mikdash ma'at, a small sanctuary, within whose pages God's presence might be found just as it formerly was within the four walls of the Jerusalem temple. The Bible, Duran wrote, is Israel's segula, a charged term that means both a treasured heirloom and a virtually amuletic source of special powers. For Duran and other Spanish Jews like him, these books were not simply conveyors of texts, what we call books. They possess what one scholar has called artifactual power. Duran wrote in the years between 1391 and 1415, when the church in, in, in Sfarad had embarked upon an especially virulent campaign against its Jews. By emphasizing the Bible's artifactual power, Duran was effectively offering his fellow Jews at the time a place of refuge that was immediately available to them, a sacred shelter inside of which they could occupy themselves in Torah study and thereby defend themselves against the hostile world outside. A Mikdash Yah Bible assured its owner and its students that God had not abandoned them. He may have destroyed the Jerusalem temple in the year 70 CE, but he continued to inhabit the Bible as a book. This was the real force of the temple analogy. And by investing their wealth in such ornate and extravagant books whose splendor self-consciously emulated the legendary beauty of the ancient temple, wealthy Sephardi Jews, literally on the brink of a historical cataclysm, sought to make their Bibles into sites in which they could find God's indwelling presence, his Shekhinah, for themselves. This, I would propose, is the meaning that a Bible like the Free Library Bible would have possessed for a late 15th century Sephardi Jew. Now, let's return to this Bible's own somewhat mysterious story. As I remarked earlier, the book's colophon states unequivocally that the book was written in 1496, four years after the Spanish expulsion. 
That's the one thing that wasn't effaced. So the Bible could never have been written in Spain itself. And yet, it looks exactly like a late 15th century Castilian Bible and nothing like Bibles produced in the Lisbon workshop at precisely the same time, even though the Bible was presumably produced in Lisbon in 1496. So how do you explain this apparent discrepancy? Well, there are two possibilities. The first is that the Bible was begun in Spain, and when a scribe or the Bible's patron were expelled from their homeland, they fled to Portugal, as many Spanish Jews did, and took their books, including the unfinished Bible, along with them. And there in Portugal, the owner had it completed. In this case, we can say that the book itself underwent the same process of expulsion as did its owner and the other Jews of Spain. This is one possible narrative. The other is that the Bible was initially commissioned in Portugal by a wealthy Spanish emigre who wished to own a Bible that reminded him of his birthplace whenever he looked at it, perhaps even daily. As scholars have noted, in the cultural imagination of post-expulsion Sephardi Jewry, Spain came to assume for many Spanish exiles the virtual status of a lost and still longed for Zion. The expulsion from Spain carried the symbolic charge for them of a second galut, a second dispersion. In this scenario, one might say that the Bible would have served for, the, for its patron as a visible, tangible connection between his exiled self and the land he believed was his real home. But whichever narrative you prefer, I hope you can already feel the winds of history stirring and what the heart of a Jew thrust into that stormy historical moment may have felt as he or she was caught up in those winds. Now, to be sure, many details of the Bible's history remain unknown. As we saw earlier, the name of the scribe who wrote the Bible was defaced on the colophon where it originally appeared. The eminent Israeli paleographer, Edna Engel, who first studied the manuscript, attributed it to the scribe Samuel ben Samuel ibn Musa, who was active in Portugal in the Lisbon workshop I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, Ibn Musa happened to be the famous, happened to have written the famous Lisbon Bible, a page of which we also saw earlier. But my student, Tali Arbit, identified another much more likely scribe named Isaac ben Ishai Sasson, who actually, we know, worked in both Spain and Portugal. Among other manuscripts, Isaac wrote a remarkable two volume Bible, which today is part of the Bruginsky collection in Zurich. I've put the colophons of the two volumes of the Bible in the image now on the screen. Isaac completed the first volume, the volume whose colophon is on the left side of the screen, in 1491 in Osana, Castile, while the second one, with its colophon on the right, was completed in Evora, Portugal in 1494, and he wrote two years after the expulsion from Castile. Both micrographic Masoretic designs and the colophons of these two volumes, uh, these two codices resemble those of the Free Library Bible. Isaac ben Ishai Sasson could have been the scribe who began the Bible in Spain and later completed it in Portugal. Or he could have been hired in Portugal to write a Castilian Bible since he was clearly expert in the genre. Now, the names of the scribe and of the patron are not the only thing that we don't know about this Bible. We also have no knowledge of its history between 1496 and 1840. The little we do know is that in 1497, the Jews left Portugal, and this Bible presumably journeyed with its owner to the next place of refuge. Most likely, that place was Constantinople, Turkish Istanbul, which was a major haven for Sephardi refugees from the Iberian Peninsula. Constantinople is, in any case, where we next hear of our Bible, but only three and a half centuries later in the year 1840. In that year, the history of our Islamicizing Bible once again got entangled in a Jewish-Christian conflict. In 1840, 
A terrible blood libel broke out in Damascus, Syria, in which a number of important Jews in the community were accused of murdering a Christian monk and subsequently were imprisoned and tortured. The accusation drew international attention and Moses Chaim Montefiore, the English financier, philanthropist, and international defender of Jews in distress, traveled to Alexandria in order to intervene with uh, Mehmad Muhammad Ali, the ruler of Egypt, who then ruled Syria as well. And Montefiore finally convinced Muhammad Ali to put an end to the affair and release the Jewish prisoners. Montefiore then traveled to Constantinople and obtained an audience with the Sultan of Turkey, Abdul Masid I, who issued a firman, a decree, declaring the blood libel baseless and ridiculous. Now, traveling with Montefiore throughout this trip was his secretary and interpreter of Oriental and modern languages, a person named Louis Lowe. Lowe was a Salatian-born Jew who had received a traditional Jewish education in the yeshivot of Moravia and Slovakia, in particular Pressburg, Bratislava, where he studied under Moshe Sofer, the famous Khatam Sofer. He then enrolled in the University of Berlin, which awarded him a doctorate in philosophy and linguistics at the age of 26. And shortly later, in 1835, he moved to England, largely in order to continue his philological studies. And there he met Montefiore, who recruited him to be his aide and assistant on his travels. Lowe later went on to become a prominent leader of the English Jewish community, the librarian of the Duke of Sussex Library. He had, the Duke of Sussex has incredible Hebrew manuscripts, many of which are in the Bodleian at Oxford as well. He also became the principal of Jews College and the head of the yeshiva. He was also the great grandfather, that is Louis Lowe, of the great recently deceased English scholar of medieval Hebrew literature, Raphael Lowe, who, when I was a graduate student in Harvard in the late 70s, I actually heard lectures. So I feel a very distant connection to Lewis Lowe personally. Now, in addition to being a scholar, Lewis Lowe was a very serious bibliophile and collector. And while he was in Constantinople with Montefiore, late one Friday afternoon on the eve of the Sabbath in 1840, at the home of a distinguished leader of the Istanbul Jewish community, Abraham Commando, Lowe bought this Bible from its owner. We don't know who the owner of the book was. It may have been Commando himself. But on the inside leaf, Lowe attached an inscription in Hebrew describing how, and I'm quoting here, I purchased the book at full price at the time I was with Sir Moses Montefiore. May God watch over him and save him in the city of Constantinople in order to save our brothers of the house of Israel living in the cities of Damascus and Rhodes from the blood libels with which the inhabitants of their land had charged them. I have written these lines on the day on which it was told to us that the Sultan gave us the order that we had requested from his majesty. So the purchase of this book may be said to have celebrated another salvation of the Jews. What Lowe meant when he wrote that he paid full price for the Bible was that he was not one of those wealthy European Ashkenazi collectors who came to the Orient and took advantage of their poor Sephardi cousins by paying a pittance for their books and cheating them out of their valuables. Lowe wanted us to know that he had paid a fair and honest price because he was a fair and honest man. Now that our Bible was in Lowe's possession, it again crossed a continent and the English Channel from Constantinople to London. The Bible remained in Lowe's collection until his death in 1888. He may have been the one to have it rebound in its present tortoise shell binding. In 1893, the Bible was displayed at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in an exhibit on religion that was curated by Cyrus Adler the distinguished American Jewish scholar, bibliophile, and one of the founders of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Sometime after the exposition, the Bible was sold at auction, possibly by Lowe's widow, and was bought by an English clergyman named George Holt Wilson, 
who shortly later fell into financial troubles and put the book up for auction again at an English auction house called Sotheby's, you've probably heard of that, where possibly it was acquired by John Frederick Lewis, a Philadelphia lawyer, art collector, and bibliophile, who, as I mentioned earlier, amassed an extraordinarily impressive collection that included 10 Hebrew manuscripts that you can still see today. This was the period when American book collecting was going full steam, thanks largely to Philadelphia's Rosenbach brothers, the founders of today's Rosenbach Museum and Library. And so, once again, the Bible crossed still another ocean from the old world to the new and became part of Lewis's collection. In 1936, after her husband's death, Lewis's widow, in a grand act of philanthropy, donated the entire collection to the Free Library of Philadelphia, where, as I said earlier, it languished in obscurity until its rediscovery in 2006 and its final restoration to the fold of Jewish books by Tali Arbit in her honors thesis several years ago. And now, the Rosenbach Museum and Library, with its own wonderful collection of Hebrew manuscripts and early Hebrew printed books, is also part of the Free Library. So everything we can say comes full circle. Such is the life of one Jewish book. Let me conclude with a final remark about the life of a book, the idea of the life of a book. The first thing to say is that the whole idea of the life of a book is a fiction. It's a conceit. Books don't have real lives. We know they're not people. A book is what is now called a writing platform, just like a scroll or a clay tablet or that other kind of tablet, which is our current writing technology. But the idea of a life has a heuristic utility. It enables us to bring a book, well, for lack of a better word, to life. That is to say, it enables us to speak about a book in a way that simply describing its text alone or its material or codicological features or the history of its provenance and ownership separately does not. It allows us to get at the whole book, as it were. And if one believes that a human life has a meaning, the idea of a life allows us to get at the book's meaning. The fact is that only a human life provides a model of sufficient complexity to encompass and capture the complexity of a book's existence. Much of life is, of course, fortuitous and accidental, and so is much of the life of a book. But just as our lives are what, we, are what we make of the accidents that befall us, so too a book's life is what all those who have participated in its life, the compositors of its text, its scribes and printers, the owners and readers who used it, what all of them have made of its accidents. And in some respects, not in all, a logic or narrative connecting its disparate parts, its separate and isolated accidents, may even emerge from all these piles of accidents and facts. I began this talk by asking, does a book possess a meaning beyond the text it records? I would argue, yes, it does. The Jewish Bible has functioned for much of its history and for most of its readers not only as the record of God's word, but as a marker of Jewish national and religious identity, particularly in its complicated, often fraught entanglements with its main rival book, the Christian Bible, the Old Testament. The story of the Free Library Bible is a thread of such entanglements, as you've seen, from the conception behind its ornate production through its eerily accidental implication in the Damascus blood libel. But whether or not one accepts this claim about the larger meaning of a book, there is no question that this book has had a life, even if only a life as a conceit. Now, this too leads to further questions. For example, is a Jewish book's life essentially different from that of a Christian or Islamic book's life? And that is a very serious question worth pondering. But for now, I think we need only say that anthropomorphism has a place in scholarship 
in no more vital place than in the history of the book, and particularly in the history of the Jewish book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stern. That was an incredible lecture. Now you can see we're larger than postage stamps. Yes, you have now graduated to uh, larger people. Let me uh, take a look at what kind of questions we have. I may have some for you as well. Uh, okay, I'm just looking at the chat. Hi, Robert. You'll be on. Okay, let's, let's find, ask a question. All right, here's a good one. Is there some critical point later in Jewish sacred book history when it's clear that the codices are openly disassociating themselves from anything tied to Islamic culture? Openly disassociated themselves? Yes. Well, it's not a question of disassociating themselves. Um, you know, they, they tend to, the books tend to be, uh, to reflect the majority cultures in which Jews live. So that as more Jews live in Christian majority cultures, the books tend to mirror Christian um, majority cultures. And today's books mirror whatever we want to call our culture, Western culture, which is neither Christian or Jewish you know, it's secular, it's homogenized, it's boring. Um, uh, there's no active rejection of Islamic culture. And I, I should say, I mean, this is something that, uh, that's really only happened in scholarship over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Uh, that's to say, a really full appreciation of the impact of Islam in every dimension upon the formation of Judaism uh, in the most formative periods of Judaism, as I say, from, you know, beginning in the, uh, the seventh century from when Islam really begins, especially through the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, the impact of Islam is enormous. 95% of the Jews in the world live within the Islamic orbit up until the, you know, the 12th century. And, uh, and the, and Islamic influence is just everywhere. I mean, influence is not quite the right word because influence suggests that the people being influenced are passive agents. They're not, but Jews are appropriating features of Islamic culture, and I'm not talking just about decoration or art, philosophy, grammar, modes of argument, uh, modes of interpretation from their Islamic neighbors, and they're polemicizing against them at the same time, using the same tools. Mm. So, uh, so this is something which uh, has only really begun to be appreciated in the last, you know, 20 years fully. And, and the work is really, you know, it's just begun. I mean, there's, uh, there's so much left to do. So. Uh, okay. Uh, we have an interesting comment uh, on Abraham Camondo. Someone put... Uh, a uh, really interesting comment about who he was and kind of a mini biography. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. But I would I would love to hear that. What he lived in well, Constantinople was a wealthy Sephardi Jew who later moved to Paris and was instrumental in developing the neighborhood around the Parc Monceau. His son Moses was a great collector who rebuilt his father's already elaborate home into an even more ornate one. It is now a museum named for his son Nisim. Oh, oh that's Nisim de Commando museum. I know where that is. The mm. house rivals Versailles and it's decorative art, but there's no Judaica in it, I don't think. Is there? You would have to tell us. I don't know. But I, I've never been there, but I've seen, you know, I I definitely know of it. So, okay. uh, oh, that's actually very interesting. Here, uh, Susan Conlachman, who's a professor um, emerita of music, 
wants to know if the Bibles are, it's, is it a complete Tanakh or just the Torah, the five books? And then secondly, uh, she points out, since the Torah must be halakhically copied from another Torah, uh, the song of the Reed Sea is laid out on the page in every Torah. She makes a comment. So, well, uh, go, yeah. Well, it is a complete Bible. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be, a codex does not have to be copied from a scroll, a Sefer Torah. And these were not copied from a Sefer Torah. And a Sefer Torah actually can be copied from a codex. It doesn't have to be, the scroll does not have to be copied from another scroll. It can be copied from a codex. But the codices do replicate the line layout that one finds in scrolls. And uh, especially with the uh, Song at the Sea and say the Song of Moses and so on. So, uh, uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there aren't the same sort of halachic strictures that would disqualify a, a codex, that would disqualify a Torah scroll, that is, they make it not kosher for reading from in the synagogue, chanting from in the synagogue, mm -hmm. but, um, but they tend to replicate it. Yeah. All right, these questions are coming fast and they're good ones. So we're going to have to kind of rifle through them. Um, do we have a translation of the Arabic inscription at the bottom of Lowe's inscription of the Lisboa Bible? Isn't do we have a transcription of the uh, of the Arabic inscription at the bottom of Lowe's Bible? So I think that's that's what you went over. Is it? It's not in Arabic, so far as I know. Translation of the Arabic inscription. There might be one in, in the Lisbon Bible, perhaps in the Lisbon Bible, but I, I don't know. There okay. probably is. There's okay. a facsimile of that Bible. So. All right. So I'm just we're just going to do them quickly. Um, do Iberian Hebrew Bibles uh, of the pre-expulsion times turn up in uh, the Maghreb? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they turn up in the Maghreb, and we have Bibles that were composed in the Maghreb. Um, uh, actually, early Bibles. That there, there's, there, there is a Bible, um, an early Sephardi Bible from before the 12th century, that probably before the 12th century. It might be our earliest Sephardi Bible that was written. Mm -hmm. If it was written, it was written probably in the Maghreb. It might be the earliest surviving one. But it's not dated or... You know the place is not known, but but the script might be from the Maghreb. So yeah, but they do. I mean, it's, and the Maghreb is a kind of suburb of Iberia. Okay. So. It is past eight o'clock, David. Uh, do you want to work overtime and continue with sure. the question? Sure. Sure. I charge double, but you know. Okay, I knew you would. Um, did church officials have knowledge of these Bibles and or use them as evidence of heresy, given their talismanic value? No, they, well, they definitely knew of their existence and they collected them and, uh, and Spanish nobility collected them. Uh, Spain has great Bibles, which were collected by Christian nobility and by the church. I mean, they confiscated them too and kept them in monastery libraries and cathedral libraries. They were not used as evidence of any sort of heresy, not Bibles. I mean, other books were like the Talmud and so on um but not these bibles no and when i say that w w when i was referring to their amuletic power their artifactual power mm -hmm. i wasn't referring to that literally in other words nobody uh it wasn't okay. like a magic book it didn't find you a parking place if you carried it around with you or put it <laughs> in your car God. um it wouldn't do that unfortunately but oh. um okay uh, yeah are there additional techniques that can be attempted to read the smudged out portions? I mean, I just to come try ultraviolet light, but nothing's worked. <laughs> they really defaced it. All right. Is most or all micrography Masora? 
uh, I, he says, or she says, I see so many micrography uh, examples from the British Library on Twitter, for example. So is, is most or all micrography Masora? No, in, in other books, it can be other things. In Bibles, it tends to be Masora. I mean, in verses from the Bible itself. I mean, Masora quotes Bible incessantly, verses from the Bible. Um, so, uh, but in Bibles, it, it tends to be Masora and Bible verses. No, in other books, it's often uh, commentaries, right? Um, different types of glosses, and so on. So uh, it's not just and and it continues. I mean, you can get um, there are people still writing micrography today. I. I saw, oh, okay. you know, yeah. uh, what was it? Herzl's speech at the first Zionist Congress. I saw a, a picture of Herzl, a portrait of Herzl that had created out of the, the text of his speech. Um, and, uh, you know, there's probably someone who's made, you know, a picture of Donald Trump out of micrography with the art of the deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could, you could do it with any text. Right. Yeah, uh, we got clarification on the um, Arabic transcription. She says on the bottom of the page where uh, Louis Slow described his acquisition of the Bible, there's a line that appears to be in Arabic, and she was referring specifically to that line. Uh, if there's a translation of that, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Neither do I. I'm, I think I'm supposed to know that. I don't remember. I would have to check. Yeah, you know, we'd have to check and get back to, to you. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I don't remember, actually. All right. I think uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure, and uh, I think you gave us a, a really important uh, and enlightening, enlightening lecture in a, in a much-needed time. So remember, everybody,